Nirvishesha Shunyapadi Paschacha de Satavine Vancha Kaupa Tarubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bayevacha Patitanam Pavan Ebyo Vaishnavibyo Namo Namaha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Atvaita Gadadhar Sri Vasade Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare. So welcome everyone to our ongoing study of Srimad Bhagavatam and we are studying Queen Kunti's prayers and today we will also go on to Bhishma Dev. Alright, so uh, we did not quite finish the slide which we had for the last lesson, so I'll just go back to that. Uh, maybe I'll I'll just share the screen here. Okay, everyone can see the slide. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, here we are. Okay, th we were at this slide. Uh, talking about the Pandavas, who were ideal executors of the standard of civilization. Right? That the, the Pandavas were not idle parasites of the Lord. They worked hard. <laughs> they really endeavoured. Well, particularly so in the case of the battle of Kurukshetra, they were active. They were not sit simply sitting in the background and sending the soldiers out, but they were in front leading the army. And so they're, they're good examples. And they were all, Yudhisthira of course was administrator. And when they performed the Rajasuya sacrifice, he sent the Pandavas in different directions to conquer and to bring back gold to perform the Yajna. So they were very active, uh, they were of the highest character and they were also hard working. So they're good examples. We'll go ahead. Oh, we would like you to just look over text number 40, chapter 8 and see if you can pick up some Pick out from that purport something about Prabhupada's modern mission. Text number 40. Okay, I'll just read the purple. I'll just read the translation. All these cities and villages are flourishing in all respects because the herbs and grains are in abundance. The trees are full of fruits, the rivers are flowing, the hills are full of minerals, and the oceans are full of wealth. All this is due to your glancing over them. And Prabhupada begins the purport. Human prosperity flourishes by natural gifts and not by gigantic industrial enterprises. And so that's certainly very much in Prabhupada's mood. 
Prabhupada was not so much impressed with big industries and factories and he understood the nature of that, those, that kind of uh, society or civilization which was only interested in industry. He saw how hellish the conditions were. People, unfortunate people have to live and work, spend their days working in these terrible places and a few people enjoy the results. Any comments? Thank you, Mr. Maharaj. Maharaj, uh, Sri Vas Pandit Das here. Yes, Prabhu. Uh, this, this is the point uh, in the, uh, regarding the mood and mission of Prabhupada, that uh, Prabhupada doesn't want uh, people to have the exploitative motive to lord it under, uh, over material nature. If we exploit the material nature, then we can become entrapped by the reactions of reactions okay yes thank you very much certainly true the yeah, Prabhupada explains here in the in his purport about how the workers just simply become more and more dissatisfied and so much unrest we know we, we see often there are strikes and protests those kind of thing going on, people are not happy, they want more money and then all of a sudden the industry collapses and it's closed and everybody's made unemployed. That's also another factor which comes along. Unemployment, the risk is so great. And we can see now, the present time, so many people unemployed, so many people have lost their jobs, there's no work. Airline pilots, all the people involved in those flights, so many people out of work. And so many people in the travel industry, tourist industry, they have no work. A lot of places, people all over the world, they're, they're in this crisis. So Prabhupada's mood was very much depend on nature, working the land and making use of natural resources. People think, oh, too simple, very simple, very primitive. But actually, it's a natural life and people can be happy and satisfied. Anyone else like to comment? Yes, please. Hare Krishna, my voice is clear. Yes. Vinay Damodar, is it? Um, yes, yes, Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, in this purport, uh, uh, Prabhupada has given us a way to come out of uh, uh, the current. <laughs> devotional life and if we do the seriously devotional uh, services then mercy will flow and then natural gifts will come and and in such a way we can come out of uh, uh, the current cycle of uh, industrial uh, life and uh, come fully dependent on uh, God and nature and uh, uh, give more time for devotional service. Yes, give more time for devotional service. That's a good point. It's an important point. People often say like they have no time. They're so busy, so many hours traveling to work and coming home and so many hours working in the office or in the factory and they have no time. But you can see if they, if they live a natural life, they work the land and depend on nature's resources, then they can have proper time to engage in devotional service. Thank you, Prabhu. Would anyone else like to contribute in this discussion? Arishtha Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu. Yeah, uh -huh. uh, Maharaj, Prabhu encouraged the farm, farm communities, which encourages simple living and high thinking. 
Simple living and high thinking. Yes, definitely true. We know, of course, a lot of people like in, in the South, and not only South, but in India in general, the many farmers, uh, they were attracted to go to the Middle East because they have only one season. There's only like one season when they can do farming. When the rains come, the rainy season, that time they can plant and harvest. But the rest of the year is nothing to do. And so they, they go off to the Middle East and they work in these places, work in some desert or some oil corporation, oil uh, resource mining. And they're attracted. But now, you know, so many who went there, they have no work anymore. They had to come back. So it's very unpredictable, uncertain. But simple living, high thinking. That if they know how to make use of their time, that's important. All right. So it's a very interesting purport. Certainly, Prabhupada's mood is very much in expressed in this purport that he was not. He didn't like to see these, these things, the, the future of the world. Just going ahead, so I'll read the slide. So simply by Krishna's glancing, Kunti's expressing that so many beautiful things are there, simply by your glance. So if you simply plead for Krishna's glancing, so there is no question of scarcity, there is no question of need. Everything will be complete. From Srila Prabhupada's lecture on this verse in Los Angeles. Yes, Prabhu. Yes. Is this the correct mission of Prabhupada that we can derive from uh, this uh, this word? That we can derive from this verse that everyone can be happy. Everyone can be happy by doing devotional service. So that is the uh, mission of Prabhupada. <laughs> Well, certainly Prabhupada wanted everyone to have a better life. He, one of the missions of ISKCON was that people should have a more natural way of life and encourage people in higher thinking. Certainly, if we, if we have a more natural way of life, generally people can, can be happier. You know, I was told that some time back they did a survey to find out who are the happiest people in the world, and they, they did, uh, the survey showed that the people in Bangladesh were the happiest people in the world. Now, Bangladesh is not the wealthiest country in the world, but the people there were happy, living naturally, living off the land. They were actually happy in that environment. But, you know, you, we look at the so-called materially opulent countries, we don't see that people are happy. We don't see that people are actually peaceful and satisfied. They take so much, they have, they, you know, there's so much, much drug addiction, there's so much intoxication, there's so much divorce. They have so many social problems. So the opulence doesn't, just because people live in opulence with so many things for sense gratification doesn't make people happy. Happiness is not something found just by the objects of the senses. So Krishna consciousness is a process by which people can actually awaken real happiness. They can actually become peaceful. 
And according to the statement here by Queen Kunti, there's no question of scarcity. There's no question of need. Everything will be complete just by Krishna's glancing. Krishna provides. So being happy with what is given to us by the grace of Krishna. Okay. Thank you, Prabhu. Would like to go ahead? All right. We've finished the... Oh. We've finished the text. Uh, mood and mission. We, we discussed ways to develop the mood of a kinchana. Do you remember in the last class we spoke about a kinchana? A kinchana meaning? Who remembers? What does it mean? I'm sorry, I can't hear you, Prabhu. Completely exhausted with the material. Completely exhausted with the material. Yeah, we said kinchana means something and a kinchana means nothing. So a kinchana gocharam, one who is one who is a, uh, a gocharam meaning approaching, approaching we can approach Krishna when we have nothing. When, if we think we have something, that we possess something, then it's difficult to approach Krishna. But a kinchana, one who actually has nothing. So how to actually develop that mood of a kinchana? Of course, you could say by Krishna consciousness, right? By cultivating the mood of Krishna consciousness, understanding that Krishna is a proprietor, that everything belongs to him. Do you remember I gave the example about two people who were a kinchana from Prabhupada's lecture? I spoke about Gorkishodas Babaji and Ramananda Rai. And they, they were both a kinchana. Now Ramananda Rai was a family man and he was a governor, but he was a kinchana because he was fully Krishna conscious. He understood everything belongs to Krishna. So that is uh, the idea. Any comments on this? Developing the mood of a kinchana? No comments? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Can I, uh, yes? Hare Krishna. Shri Vas Pandit Das here. Maharaj, just one comment. That, uh, a kinchana means even though a person has got everything, still he should not be attached to that thing. Then only he can approach Krishna. Even though, like, like you, the, you gave the example. Okay. Of Ramanandra has everything but he is not attached. So right. he is also a kinchana. Yeah. Like, is also a he does, really doesn't have it. Right. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Maharaj. Yes? I was just going to say that it also seems to be quite helpful the distresses that one undergoes in life to become materially exhausted. One can see that there's no, no, no lasting satisfaction and sense gratification and oftentimes that's why devotees initially come to Krishna consciousness and then that's fortified of course by the sadhana practices and the, the philosophy applying the philosophy in our lives but many many devotees come to the movement you know because they're just burnt out you know and they may not be fully exhausted but they're burnt out from the distresses of material life. And uh, they, that helps them choose to take up spiritual life. Yes. Very true. Very true. Many people come to Krishna conscious. Prabhupada also said, usually we come in some, some kind of distress, as, or if, as you put it, that they're just disgusted or exhausted with the material world. They've had enough. They just want to give up that material life. So in that, in that sense, they're, they're somewhat of a kinchana. Sometimes they come to Krishna consciousness and then again they become entangled 
And then they have to become a kinchana again, they become more kinchana, they collect more difficult situation. All right, going ahead, personal application, ways we can improve the uttering of the holy name with reference to 826. 826. All right, Prabhupada spoke about the chanting of the holy name in 826 about how we were just, oh, this, that's the, the same verse, Akinshana Gocharam, right? That we become more Akinshana sometimes when we're in a helpless condition, when we're totally helpless. I heard from the devotees in Chaupati, I think it was maybe Radhanath Maharaj himself was giving the example, but from the Chaupati Tampo, they said one night there was tremors and the buildings were shaking. So in the middle of the night, everyone had to get out of the building. Everyone was outside the building in the middle of the night and the, the you know, buildings were shaking. And there was fear there was going to be a big earthquake that the ground's going to open up. And they, they said it was the best chanting they ever did. So when one is in that, you know, life-threatening situation, it can really help us to really utter the holy name with quality. But Prabhupada talks about somebody who has, an, if he's sitting with a lot of opulence and material satisfaction, then it's not so easy to feelingly utter the holy name. But when we're in a helpless condition, then it, we, we, we have greater quality. Everyone agree on that? Yes, much. Mm -hmm. So, of course, uh, <laughs> we don't always get that opportunity, but probably it comes, and certainly at the end of life, that's also there, that chance, trying to take shelter of the Holy Name. Then the Pandavas, as ideal executors of work with valor, but depending completely on the Lord. We spoke about them. All right. Kunti's bewilderment in remembering devotional attitude of Yasoda. Would someone like to explain that? What was this referring to? Yes, Prabhu. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, the Lord Krishna is fear personified, but he was trembling in fear of Mother Yashoda. <laughs> Mother Yashoda, for Mother Yashoda, of course, she can only think of Krishna as her child. And she doesn't think of Krishna as the Supreme Lord. She's in her Vatsalya Ras. And Kunti, it's a, not quite the same. Kunti is not on the same level of Mother Yashoda. Kunti is not a, a bridge basi. She's not in that mood of braja with the raga, raga bhakti. Okay. A final quote by Prabhupada. Just like here, we are also hearing and chanting. What is the subject matter? The subject matter is Krishna. We're not hearing here any market report. What is the price of this? What is the price of this share, that share? No, we are hearing about Krishna. And when there is question of hearing, there must be speaking or chanting. So are we, we are speaking and chanting about Krishna. That is bhakti. Simply always be engaged in hearing and chanting about Krishna from Prabhupada's teachings of Queen Kunti, 1836. Okay, Srila Prabhupada Ki Chai. All right, so we'll go on to the uh, next text, next lesson. Uh, Have to open it.
what does this say? Oh, Krishna. Okay, lesson four. Can everyone see? Slide is visible? Okay. Yes, yes. Good. Okay, so we're going on to hear about Yudhisthira's dejection and then Bhishma Dev's instruction. Review of lesson three. We, we, had, a, we had quite a, a bit of already. Anyway, the meaning of Akinchana Gocharam we talked about and discussed ways to develop that. Ways we can improve the chanting, Krishna's bewilderment, the Pandavas as ideal executors, and Prabhupada's statement about human prosperity. All right, so we'll go on to lesson four. Prayers of Queen Kunti. We're still on prayers of Queen Kunti. Here's text number 41. O Lord of the universe, soul of the universe, O personality of the form of the universe, Please, therefore, sever my tie of affection for my kinsmen, the Pandavas and the Vrishnis. <laughs> so Queen Kunti is in this unfortunate position. We could say unfortunate. Or actually, it's very fortunate because she has kinsmen. She's had, she has relationships both with the Pandavas and with the Vrishnis. All right, what's happening? You can see from the picture, Lord Krishna is getting ready to go to Dwarka to be with the Vrishnis and means he's going to leave the Pandavas. So Queen Kunti is approaching the Lord and at this time, of course, she offers her prayers to the Lord. And here's one of the prayers, well-known prayer. Maybe when you go to if you're in Mayapur, you go to Ganga, you take bath in Ganga, you chant this verse. All right? It's the Ganges forever flows to the sea without hindrance. Let my attraction be constantly drawn unto you without being diverted to anyone else. So Queen Kunti's prayer is like that. She is attracted to both the Pandavas and to the Vrishnis. But she wants that her attraction should simply be to Krishna, without hindrance. So from Prabhupada's purport, Srila Prabhupada explains, to cut off the tie of all other affections does not mean complete negation of the finer elements like affection for someone else. This is not possible. A living being Whoever he may be must have this feeling of affection for others because this is a symptom of life. So, <laughs> going back to this verse, uh, Queen, this 42 and also 41, 41, sever my tie of affection for my kinsmen. You know, this could... This could be abused, there could be some problems, people coming to Krishna consciousness and they may want to give up all kinds of relationships with family and relatives, that these relationships are just a hindrance to me. Do you have any any experience in the, like this and working with devotees? Sometimes a, a new devotee comes and he wants to get away from the family, he wants to leave, he may even be married, he wants to leave his wife or the wife wants to leave the husband and leave the children. They just want to be a devotee and, they're, they're, and, they, say, and they may quote this verse, they may quote Queen Kunti. You know that these kind of things do happen. We have, we did have cases, right? Young, young women coming to Krishna consciousness, and then later on, regretting it or making a court case against the movement, and we have to pay so much money 
to the, the family, these kind of things. So Srila Prabhupada explains here that cutting off the tie of affection does not mean negation of the finer elements like affection for someone else. It's natural to have feelings, to have affection. This is a, a symptom of life. So when Kunti, Queen Kunti is praying, she's praying, she's offering these prayers in the mood of the pure devotee, very elevated pure devotee. But we're encouraged to follow in the footsteps of great devotees, right? So is it wrong if somebody wants to give up all connections with the family and with, with these uh, other people? Any comments? Yes, Prabhu? All right. Queen Kunti had such nice children in form of Pandavas who were pure devotees. So actually, it is very difficult to cut the attachment of such nice children. So similarly, the parents of children they are always having the attachment to the children because if children are unhappy, the parents also become unhappy. So it is very very difficult to cut the attachment. So how? We should pray and how basically how to understand the prayer of Harani to basically be, uh, to cut the attachment of the family member. <laughs> well, how, how to understand the prayers of Queen Kunti? We have to understand with the help of Srila Prabhupada. Right? Like, by Srila Prabhupada's commentary on this, on this, this verse. So I'm, we're quoting, I'm, I'm quoting from the purport here, and Prabhupada was explaining here that we cannot simply give up the affection. It's not possible. So you have children, naturally you have some affection for them. And Prabhupada also, of course, he had children of his own. And he, he tried his best to give them Krishna consciousness. But at, at a certain point, you have to give them independence, right? I'm sure, Jen Master, may I know you have a, you have two two sons, right? Right. Hmm? Would you like to explain express something about this? Well, um, Prabhupada in the purport um, at the end of the purport to forty two, um, what he's describing is that we should cut off the skin relation. Um, and develop the relationship with the soul. So the tendency um, in, in a family, even in the devotee family, is to be on the skin level, you know, to see it from a material standpoint, the relationships and the emotions or whatever. But it's, and it's a bit of a struggle, um, and this is actually, in my sense, the responsibility of the father or the husband to put it on the platform of the soul, where everything is encouraged um, for spiritual development. And um, that kind of solves the problem, you know, then the attachment's not there. Um, that diverts us from our developing attachment for Krishna and uh, diverts us, diverts our spiritual development. Okay. Yeah, it's possible, but it's not easy. <laughs> definitely, definitely not easy, right, yeah. Uh, um, we have also, of course, Lord Chaitanya taking sannyas at the age of 24 and leaving his young wife. I think Vishnu Priya was 16 and she was with his mother, an elderly mother. So, was that irresponsible of Lord Chaitanya? But of course, his purpose was for the greater cause. You cannot just simply stay at home and think only to deliver the family. The other example is Lord Ramachandra, that Lord Ramachandra also 
gave up his wife so that he could show the example of the ideal king. I don't know what the ladies who are in our class think. Would you like to respond? Some metaji from the class? You could give us your contribution, your feeling on this matter. Hare Krishna. Prabhu, uh, can I answer? I'm Yes. Okay. Ma Sita, she also left Ramchandra. As Ramchandra left, Sita ji also, she went to the forest just because everyone, uh, just for, uh, like, uh, I mean, she didn't worry about herself. At that, at that time she was pregnant, but she didn't worry. She said, no, it, for your glory and for everyone's uh, benefit, I'll go to, uh, I'll go myself. And she went away. And that way. Oh, really? It's like that, is it? She, she herself w went willingly. Yeah, she, she in fact, uh, uh, like willingly, yeah, she encouraged Ramchandra to, uh, to leave her at that time. And she said, I'll go myself. And she encouraged him to follow his, uh, what other people are saying. She didn't uh, think about herself. Some, some people criticize Lord Ramachandra. They say it was very harsh and cruel of him to do this. Yes, and uh, that way. and she really always blessed everyone. She uh, she was very compassionate towards all always. Okay, so you're not having any difficulties with this. You you give the you give your sanction and you give their approval, huh? Uh, what I feel is like we should. Uh, Yes, if it is like, suppose uh, Jaitanya Mahaprabhu, he did for a good cause, greater cause, then uh, God is, all, I mean, then uh, uh, there is always God, and God will be there to protect uh, our family members. So, uh, like, we should, uh, in fact, as, as, a, as a, a wife, I uh, have uh, that sense of, uh, I mean, uh, attachment, but at the same, same time, I should have more attachment towards God, so God, will help me uh, materially also and spiritually also. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. So it's... it's uh, yes? I had a, one additional thought on that. Uh-huh. Like last summer, you know, a couple summers ago, I was listening to a Bhagavatam class that Radna Swami gave, and it really resonated with me. And he was saying that if, at the, an older age, you know, if the father or the mother, you know, they, they go for uh, Vanaprast, it establishes a good example for the children, you know, of what the priorities in life uh, should be. So it kind of establishes a culture. We don't see that happen much within our movement. You know, there are very few devotees that actually go for Vanaprast. And that's unfortunate because it's it's a very valuable period in one's life where spiritual advancement can be greatly accelerated. Well, I, I think there are quite a few people, Vanapra, they may not announce it, they may not put it into saffron dress or something, but there are quite a few people who okay. recognize that. You know, they're exter internally they're in the mood of Vanaprastha, so although they may not officially declare it, so, yes, it's definitely important for the, the, the children to see the example. And we heard, we heard about uh, Prabhupada's son, Prabhupada's son Vrindavan, the youngest son, he came to see Prabhupada when Prabhupada was leaving on Jaladuta to go to America. So, the devotee, he asked, they asked uh, Vrindavan Chandra about what were you thinking when you watched your father go on the Jaladuta sailing off to America. And he said, I, was feel I felt very proud of my father. So that's, that's very nice, uh, you know, that the son can feel pride in what the father's doing. So we don't usually see that kind of example in old age. But it's certainly a need to go, the older people that, you know, to go to retire and go to the holy places and show the nice example. 
But here we're talking about, uh, you know, they're not in the old age, they're still young. The Pandavas are still young, they're not ready to retire. And Queen Kunti, she has his children, and at the same time she has affection for the Vrishnis, it's her family side. And so she's torn between the two. So we have to understand what is skin affection and what is for Krishna's service. Sometimes it's difficult to see the difference. Prabhupada states here on the slide, only the objective has to be changed. Desire cannot be negated, but in devotional service, the, de the, the desire is changed only for the service of the Lord in place of desire for sense gratification. So what is for the service of Krishna and what is for our own sense gratification? Now sometimes it's a fine line, sometimes it's difficult to see. Therefore, it's important to take instruction, to take guidance, to hear from other people. Sadhu, Shastra, Guru, very important to help us to understand what is the proper action to take, not to act whimsically or just um, impulsively. Okay, any other comments on this? Maharaj, yes. sorry, my obeisance is Anir Puran from South Africa. Just a quick question. Can you maybe share some of your own experience in your own life about how you arrived at sannyas? Oh. In relation to this verse? <laughs> well, how did I get to sannyas? Well, you know, Krishna just arranges, you know, these things. You, you, wouldn't, you know, I didn't take sannyas very young. I was already over 40 when I took sannyas. So that's about the right age, you know, you, you don't want to be too young. So, material, material life is always challenging and threatening. I took sannyas, uh, what happened was uh, I was I serve in the Far East under Tamal Krishna Maharaj. So Tamal Krishna Maharaj, he, he liked very much to have sannyasis with him. He liked to see men also take sannyas. So he, you know, he, he was my inspiration. You need to have that, you need to have somebody there inspiring you, directing you. So he, he was, uh, and in, at, at one point, I didn't want to take sannyas, but at one point, because I'd seen, I'd seen uh, you know, different people fall down and give up sannyas, and it was very horrible to hear about these things. So I really didn't, I thought, I'm not going to, I, well, I don't want to risk it. But then later on, Tamal Krishna Maharaj, uh, he wanted me to, he said, you should start taking disciples. So... He want, because he was the only spiritual master, and he said, I can't initiate everyone. He said, you should also take some disciples. And uh, so I was nominated to be a, a spiritual master. At that time, I was still brahmachari. And uh, so then, after some time, after, although I was nominated as sannyasi, I didn't, as a, as a, although I was accepted as a spiritual master, I hadn't initiated anyone. But later on it became more and more necessary, I had people waiting for initiation, they'd taken shelter in several years and I hadn't initiated them. So then I thought it's appropriate, you know, if I'm going to initiate people, I should be a sannyasi. So that, so then I approached Tamal Krishna Maharaj and so he recommended me. To, that I could also take sannyas. So like that, I thought it was a necessary step. If I'm going to act as a spiritual master, then taking sannyas will be the right situation to act as a spiritual teacher. 
Of course, it's not actually really necessary, but I thought it was a necessary step. Okay? Thank you, Maharaj. Oh, one more quote about Queen Kunti here. Text 37. Oh my Lord, you have executed all duties yourself. Are you leaving us today, though we are completely dependent on your mercy and have no one else to protect us? Now when all kings are at enmity with us. And so this was uh, the, the prayers of Queen Kunti. She's saying that, that these other kings, we, you know, we've fought the battle of Kurukshetra and so many kings have been killed. But their children are all there, their descendants are there, and they may come and they may attack us. So who's going to protect us if you're going to go? These kings are still, at, they're, they're, they're still our enemies. And so we, we're depending on you for your mercy, but you're leaving us. And so this is the mood of Queen Kunti praying to Krishna, you please stay with us. So Prabhupada quotes that Queen Kunti felt such separation like a thunderbolt and the whole prayer of the Queen is to try to persuade the Lord to stay with them. So we also want to always stay with the Lord by remembering, chanting the holy name. From text 43, no amount of chosen words is sufficient. Sorry. No amount of chosen words is sufficient to enumerate the Lord's glory, and yet he is satisfied by such prayers as the Father is satisfied even by the broken lin linguistic attempts of the growing child. So offering words like this, no matter our qualification, the idea, well, as Prabhupada says here, the broken words of a child are very pleasing to the, the father. So in the same way, it's difficult for us to describe the glory of Lord Krishna, but just making the attempt is the important thing, to try to make that attempt to glorify the Lord. We feel ourselves unqualified in every way, but still we just, we just try our best and we pray to Krishna to help us, to give us the ability to speak something which may be of value or may be meaningful. All right, so we can go on to the next topic that uh, and we're going to hear about Maharaj Yudhisthira's situation, of course, after the battle of Kurukshetra. Maharaj Yudhisthira, we've put a little bit here. Lord Krishna, is, as the super soul of King Yudhisthira, he does not allow the king to be convinced, neither by the words of Vyasa or by Lord Krishna himself. What are the actual reasons for Yudhisthira's de dejection? Can you give some of the reasons, some of the different points which are listed there? Why, why Maharaj Yudhisthira is so dejected? What's the problem? Sorry, it's not very clear to me. Did somebody hear what he was saying? No, Maharaj. Oh. To enthrone, uh, he thought that because all massacre was uh, in the battlefield of Russia, he was there just to enthrone him. So he felt he rejected. Yes, can you? Uh, uh, I, I'm sorry, I couldn't get it. He thought that uh, uh, all massacre in the battlefield of Kurukshetra was just to enthrone him. Oh. 
All the deaths on the battlefield of Kurukshetra were because of him. Yes, Maharaj. So how many people died on the battlefield? 64 crore. 64 crore. Okay, 64 crore, yeah. A crore is 10 million. So 640 million. This is a, this is a big number of people, right? How many people are dying with the COVID virus? Over a million, two million. Insignificant compared to the battle of Kurukshetra, right? So that was one reason. Any other reasons? From the text, there are reasons in the text, if you read the different texts, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, I think you can find reasons. Who? Who? was feeling responsible for it. Where were the innocent people killed? I never heard of this. Killing of the, yeah, killing of the well, in 49 it says also, it says he was thinking of staying in hell for millions of years. Why? All right, but the brahmanas were all engaged in battle, right? They were like Dronacharya is a brahman, but he was in he was engaged in the battle. But he, of course, he was killed by some trick. It's true. He was wasn't actually killed in in a very fair way. But Ma Maharaj, Maharaj Yudhishthira was thinking because he was uh, very had a very good character and. Uh, he was feeling like a devotee about this, uh, uh, about this incident there. And uh, he was uh, feeling himself responsible for this. Okay. He was feeling himself responsible for everything. Yes. He was feeling that Duryodhana, Duryodhana was also ruling the kingdom quite well. Right. And there was all citizens were not happy, happy with him. But still, because he wanted to, Yudhishthira wanted to become king, that's why so many people had to be killed. Right. Duryodhan was already doing quite a good job. Nobody was really complaining about him. He was doing quite a good job. But Maharaj Yudhishthira, the Pandavas, they, well, wasn't so much that they wanted to rule, but they just wanted some land. They just wanted to be Kshatriyas. They didn't want to have nothing. Okay, for the sake of justice, he was thinking that so many people's lives were sacrificed. Yes? Yes, Maharaj? Uh, another reason I think is the, for the Yudhishthira's dejection is uh, because Krishna wanted him uh, to be instructed by uh, Bhishmadev. And I... that's why uh, Maharaj Yudhishthira was convinced, uh, was um, 
uh, couldn't be convinced uh, by the words of Yasadeva and uh, Krishna? Yes, this is a very good point. Yes, that Krishna, Krishna wants Yudhisthira to go there to be with Grandfather Bhishma, right? Also, um, another reason, Maharaj, is um, because so many of uh, there were so many grieving women after the battle. So many millions of husbands and sons have been killed, and so there was probably millions of women who were grieving with tears. So he was feeling for them. He was feeling for their suffering. Oh, wow. Yudhisthira was feeling the, the grief of these women who have become widows. Yeah. That their husbands are not going to come home. Yeah. He's feeling so compassionate. He's feeling some sorrow, for, some compassion for them. Okay. It's an interesting point. Yeah. Okay. Let me see. I've got some points here. Lord desired that. King Yudhisthira be pacified by the words of Bhisma Dev. As we, we heard this one from Maharaji. Yeah, Lord, Lord Krishna actually wanted this. He wants Bhisma Dev to reveal his glory in the, front, in the presence of everyone. Bhisma Dev hasn't actually spoken much. He hasn't given a lot of instruction, but actually he's a Mahajan. And it's revealed at the time of death. He revealed everything, his actual spiritual position, and he reveals his great depth of knowledge and realization. And it, it, it also allows Bhishma Dev to see Lord Krishna personally at the time of his departure from the world. That by Pandavas going there with Lord Krishna, Lord Krishna will be personally in the presence of Bhishma Dev, and he can give up his body looking at Lord Krishna. Bhishma Dev will also see his beloved grandchildren situated on the throne. So Bhishma Dev is going to be happy to see these Pandavas, right? After the battle's over, now the battle's over and everyone's killed and Yudhisthira's on the throne, so Bhishma, Bhishma Dev is certainly going to be happy about this situation because Bhishma Dev is very concerned for the welfare of the Pandavas. And so at the time of his departure, he can see the Pandavas and he, he can see how happy they are having won the battle of Kurukshetra and how they've become the rulers. So Grandfather Bhishma can peacefully leave the world. And all could see that Bhishma Dev excelled all in knowledge. Okay. One of Prabhupada's lectures on this. So he was thinking like that. But the real point he was missing, that whatever he has done, it has been done under the instruction of Krishna. Therefore, for ordinary men, this is a great sin. For sense gratification, if we kill so many persons, we are liable. But so far the Pandavas are concerned. They did not do it for their sense gratification. They did it for Krishna. Therefore, whatever they had done, that was right. So Maharaj Yudhisthira was, you know, he wasn't thinking that I did it for Krishna. He was thinking I, you know, I did it for my sense gratification. But actually, he did it really for Krishna. It's just like Arjuna was uh, placed into illusion at the beginning of the battle of Kurukshetra. So in a similar manner, Yudhisthira was also bewildered. And he was thinking that I've, I've fought, I've taken part in this battle just for my sense gratification, but it wasn't really like that. He did it under the direction of Lord Krishna. So here's a nice illustration of Grandfather Bhishma on his bed of arrows, waiting to depart from the world. So 
just to go over what's happening in the chapter here, chapter 9. The Pandavas have come with Lord Krishna, Maharaj Yudhisthira. They all come before Grandfather Bhishma. And along with Lord Krishna, so many sages also come. They're all coming for a very auspicious event, the departure of Lord Bhishma, departure, departure of Bhishma Dev from the world. Bhishma Dev has this power that he can leave the world at will. And so everyone's coming to witness and to hear his final words. I think he, he fell. And the battle of Kurukshetra was how many days? 18 days. 18 days. And Bhishma Dev fell on which day? 11th day. On the 11th day, was it? Okay. And so, the, and, and, and Bhagavad Gita was spoken on the, on the Akadasi day, right? So that was like, you know, the... You know, we, the recent Bhagavad Gita was spoken on, the Gita Jayanti we had on 25th of December, just in last month. So, Bhishma Dev fell, oh, the, so the ba battle of Kurukshetra began after the speaking of the Bhagavad Gita. And then 11 days fighting, and then Bhishma Dev falls. And then he's laying on the bed of arrows and he has to wait for the Uttarayana, right? He has to wait for the changing of the direction of the sun. So he was, it took some time. He was laying on the bed of arrows for many, many days. And after the battle finished, then they come, they all come, Pandavas come, Lord Krishna comes and the sages come. And Bhishma is still laying on his bed of arrows. And he's ready, he's very happy to see that. He welcomes them. And when he meets them, Bhishma Dev begins to speak about the suffering which the Pandavas have undergone. Because Bhishma Dev appreciates, he understands the situation, he can understand the mind of Yudhisthira, and he understands how he's feeling very dejected and guilty. So Bhishma Dev is speaking about the suffering which these Pandavas had undergone and how it, it was very painful for him to see the Pandavas suffering. And Bhishma Dev explained that actually the cause of this suffering was caused by Krishna in his form as eternal time. Bhishma Dev didn't blame anyone, but it's simply due to eternal time. We know the nature of the material world is problematic. There's got always going to be these different issues, conflicts. And Bhishma Dev simply said, this is all the plan of the Lord. It's due to eternal time. And then after that, then being requested by Maharaj Yudhisthira, Bhishma Dev speaks. Now, Bhishma Dev's in a very difficult situation, laying on the bed of arrows, and usually somebody's in that condition, they're going to leave the body, we would think, oh, don't disturb him. But Lord Krishna wanted Bhishma Dev to speak, because Lord Krishna wanted to show the actual glory of Grandfather Bhishma, how he's transcendentally situated. And Bhishma Dev spoke on Varnashram Dharma. And the actual Mahabharata, if you, if you get the full Mahabharata, you'll see the major portion of the Mahabharata are the instructions of Bhishma Dev. Most Mahabharatas which are published, they don't, pump, they don't print all the teachings of Bhishma Dev. If they do, it's very brief. They give very brief. But the actual Mahabharata, as compiled by Vyasa Dev, is full of so many in instructions from Grandfather Bhishma. He spoke for many, many days at great length and explained all different topics. So he did all, all of this just to show his transcendental situation. 
Lord Krishna wanted everyone to see the glory of Grandfather Bhishma, how even though he's in such a difficult condition, very similar to our Srila Prabhupada. That Srila Prabhupada, I probably, probably all of you have seen the, the film of Srila Prabhupada dictating Srimad Bhagavatam while he's uh, in his final days, only in a, in a few days later he will leave the world. But he was still laying there on his bed in Vrindavan, in Krishna Balaram Mandir, and he's speaking purports to Srimad Bhagavatam. And the devotees are recording. So just like Grandfather Bhishma, and we have also, of course, the departure of Haridas Thakur. Haridas Thakur's departure in the presence of Lord Chaitanya, performing kirtan and holding the lotus feet of Lord Chaitanya, and Haridas gave up his body. So these are glorious, these glorious manners to depart from the world. Any comments? Anything? I, I have a question. Um, does anybody know, I, I haven't really studied Mahabharata, but how, how is it that Bhishma Dev, he was shot full with, through with arrows? Is that how he ended up on a bed of arrows? It's an unusual, um, you know, I've heard that so many times, but it just dawned on me. How did that happen? Well, they're all Arjuna's arrows. Oh, okay. Bhishma was proud of that. He was proud of being filled with Arjuna's arrows. He wanted that. So he shot him while he was standing up and then he fell over? Yes. And he shot, shot through him? Yeah. Wow. Maharaj, any document uh, regarding how many days uh, Bhishma have laid on up arrows? Mm. I'm not sure. I haven't seen any document myself, but somebody mentioned to me it was like something 30 odd days. I don't know how accurate it is. It's something I'd have to investigate, uh, but certainly many days. In Srimad Bhagavatam, we don't to go much into these kind of details, we give more, the, we're more interested in the message and the philosophical teachings rather than the, you know, the time span or the chronology. Yes, please. Maharaj, uh, like you described already, like for example, uh, last year, December 2020, uh, the Ekadashi when the Bhagavad Gita was spoken was the 25th December. Yes. And Uttarayan starts from 14th January. Yes, that was this year. Yeah. But not every, not like that every year. Yeah. So, so approximately, will it, will it be around 10 days or 2 weeks? Or I don't know. It'd be longer. Longer. Yes. I heard longer. Thank you, Max. Yes. Yes, you can ask. Yes, but remember I'm saying that he was in a lot of pain, but he could tolerate the pain, that he was transcendental to the pain, and he considered it more important to give the instructions to the Pandavas and to Maharaj Yudhisthira. He wants to encourage Maharaj Yudhisthira in his role now, that Maharaj Yudhisthira is the monarch, he has to rule. And Bhishma Dev wants to encourage him and give him instructions and guidance what he has to do and how to fulfill his obligations. He doesn't want Maharaj Yudhisthira to feel guilty and to feel despondent. So he's, he's spending that time, he's remaining in the body to give these instructions. And he's also, he's also, he's been waiting for Lord Krishna to come. 
then when the auspicious time comes, when the sun starts to move to the north, Bhishma Dev chose that as the auspicious time. Actually, he could have left the body at any time. Lord Krishna had been there for some time, but he, he waited until the sun moved, started moving to the north, because according to the scriptures, that is the auspicious time to leave the body. So Bhishma Dev wanted to show everything but for a nice example for everyone. Just like Srila Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada could have left the body anywhere, but he chose to return to Vrindavan because he considered that to be the best place to leave the world. You know, Prabhupada could have left the body in America, he could have left the body in Europe, but he, he was happy to be back in Vrindavan because that was, he considered that to be his home. And he thought that's a, it's the best place to leave the world. So the example is very important. So Bhishma Dev was showing this example for everyone. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you very much, Maharaj. All right. Uh, yes, Prabhu. Uh, Prabhu, Shiva, Shiva, Shiva Pandita. Huh? Just, uh, with, uh, just I thought one thought came to my mind. Like Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, he left his, he wanted to leave his body in Calcutta in the battlefield of preaching. So he, he could, he left. Oh, interesting, yeah, oh, right, yeah, Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati, he left the body, he'd been in Puri, and then he came back from Puri, and he went to the, the, the Bara Bazaar, the Chaitanya, Mat, the, the Bara Bazaar, Gaudiya Mat temple there, in Bhag Bazaar, and left the body there, and after he departed from the world, then they brought his body in the train, they had a special train to bring his body out here to Mayapur, and they put his body in Samadhi in Mayapur. So Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati chose like that. Different devotees had different choices, like His Holiness Bhakti Tirtha Swami. Bhakti Tirtha Swami, he chose to leave his body in USA. You know, he could have come to India, but he, just, you know, he, he wanted to leave it in USA with the devotees who he'd been working with there, surrounded by them. And so it, it, it's not hard and fast, you have to do this. But different devotees have their different desires and they want to show their example in different ways. For some devotees it's certainly very convenient to leave the body in their own home place, surrounded by people they know. You know, sometimes people think, I want to go to Vrindavan and leave the body, but if they can't speak the language, they don't know people there, who will take care of them? They'll be helpless, they'll be alone. It's not very good. It's better to be with people, surrounded by people they know, who, can, who, who know them and who have relationships with them and who they can communicate with. You know, if I, if I have some old ladies from China who want to come to Vrindavan and leave the body, I don't encourage them. I don't think it's necessary because they don't know English, they can't speak the language, they don't know people there. And so it's, it's better they leave the body in the association of devotees in their own place. Right? Is it clear? Yeah, thank you, Maharaj. Thank you. Maharaj? Yes, Prabhu? Yes, Maharaj. Uh, I wanted to... I, I heard one lecture uh, where, where uh, Krishna wanted... Uh, Bhishmadev uh, to show uh, that uh, even such a great hero like Bhishmadev was not able to win if he was fighting on the uh, other side, on the wrong side. <laughs> right. And, uh, and also uh, by the leaving uh, of the, uh, the Bhishmadev, I was hearing that Uta, Uttarapayana also means that uh, Krishna who who, who protect uh, Uttara, uh, Mara, Maharaj Parikshit, that, that was also the name of, uh, of, of him. Yes, right. But Lord Krishna had been there for many days in front of Grandfather Bhishma. So it wasn't that as soon as Lord Krishna came, he immediately left the body. Grandfather Bhishma waited. He spoke for many, many days giving instruction to Yudhisthira. 
Right? We mentioned one of those reasons. We mentioned, uh, just let me go back to that previous slide. Yeah. All could see Bhishma Dev excelled all in knowledge. You know, sometimes people wonder, how is it Bhishma Dev is a Mahajan? So, he showed it at the time of his departure on the battlefield. That's when he revealed his actual position as the Mahajan. It came in these final, in this final Leela, departing from the world. Okay? This one? No, before this one. Yes, thank you, Maharaj. Okay. Okay, going ahead. Speaking about the wonderful influence of inevitable time, Grandfather Bhishma pacifying the mind of Maharaj Yudhisthira. Uh, so, writes, despite the power of pious acts, the power of personalities, the power of expert management, and the power of weapons under the direct supervision of Lord Krishna, the Pandavas suffered so many practical reverses, which can only be explained as due to the influence of Kala, inevitable time. You, know, you have everything, but still you suffer. You, <laughs> they didn't do it. So try to understand their suffering was not due to karma. This is the point. It's due to simply the, the influence of time, inevitable time. Kala is identical with the Lord Himself, and therefore the influence of Kala indicates the inexplic inexplicable wish of the Lord Himself. There is nothing to be lamented when a matter is beyond the control of any human being. So that's a very valuable, very powerful point made by Srila Prabhupada. When it's beyond the control of any human being, there's nothing to be lamented. We have to understand like that. We have to understand these things in the proper way. So by the help of Grandfather Bhishma, we're appreciating the effects of Kala, the influence of the Lord. Simply beyond the control. There's nothing we could do about it. So there's no reason for Maharaj Yudhisthira to be despondent. The sufferings of the Pandavas were never due to their past deeds. The Lord has had to execute the plan of establishing the kingdom of virtue and therefore, his own devotees suffered temporarily in order to establish the conquest of virtue. This was Lord Krishna's reason. Although Duryodhana and, and was ruling and doing a good job, the Lord wanted that the devotees should rule. He didn't want just Duryodhana. He didn't just simply want good management. He wanted devotee management. That's the plan of the Lord. So Lord Krishna arranged this, the difficulties, all the sufferings which they had to go through. It's all temporary, of course. The sufferings which we all go through, it's, always, it's all temporary. Sufferings are not eternal. We have to understand the plan of the Lord. So the Lord wanted to bring the Pandavas into the glorious situation. See here. Accept tribulations as a benediction. The popular saying is that a housewife teaches the daughter-in-law by teaching the daughter. Similarly, the, the Lord teaches the world by teaching the devotees. We often give that example, right? The daughter-in-law is taught by the mother. She teaches her daughter because daughter-in-law is too sensitive. She's a new, just recently married and come to the home. 
mother doesn't want to upset her. So she teaches her daughter and hopes the daughter-in-law will learn. The same way the Lord is teaching the world by teaching his devotees. Whenever, therefore, a show is made to teach the devotee, it is for teaching the less intelligent men. A devotee's duty, therefore, is to ungrudgingly accept tribulations from the Lord as a benediction. From chapter 9, text number 17. This is a mindset. We have to adjust the mind, understand when tribulations come, it's a benediction. And Prabhupada saw that like that. Prabhupada had also his tribulations difficulties in his family life. And of course Prabhupada used to remember those words of Krishna in Srimad Bhagavatam. Krishna says, when I'm very merciful to someone, I take everything away from them. So Prabhupada saw Krishna take everything away from him. His business, his money, the family were no longer respectful. He saw it was all Krishna's plan. Krishna took everything away, it was a benediction, so that Prabhupada was more free to go and preach. And of course Krishna gave him so much more. He gave him so much more wealth and so many more children and so many more homes. So we must see also the plan of the Lord, the tribulations, the difficulties, that they're a benediction. Thank you Krishna. exchange of transcendental bhava. Tribulations imposed upon the devotees by the Lord constitute another exchange of transcendental bhava between the Lord and the devotees. The Lord says, I put my devotees into difficulty and thus the devotee becomes more purified in exchanging transcendental bhava with me. But we have, the, it's similar to what we studied in uh, Queen Kunti, that when we're in a dangerous situation, we have greater attachment for the Lord. If we're materially comfortable, it's not very good for our spiritual life. It's better we put ourselves into, accept some difficulties, accept some hardships. It's actually very good for us to develop our transcendental consciousness. Everyone agree? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> now we're all in difficulty, many in difficulty with, with the lockdown and different things going on. So it's very good for us. More hearing and chanting, more intense devotional service. Oh. <laughs> I don't know if we want to do this exercise. Uh, we don't have a lot of time left. Uh, let me see, we'll, we'll come back, maybe we'll go on first and we can always come back to that. Uh, Bhishma Dev's instructions to Maharaj Yudhisthira. So we're hearing he's going to speak about Varnashram Dharma. So Lord Sri Krishna inspired Maharaj Yudhisthira to ask Bhishma Dev in the presence of many great sages, indicating thereby that the Lord's devotee, like Bhishma Dev, although apparently living as a worldly man, is far superior to many great sages, even Vyasa Dev. So you cannot judge the person's spiritual position just by material circumstances. Prabhupada writes, one should not have asked him any question at that time, but Lord Sri Krishna wanted to prove that his pure devotees are always sound in body and mind by dint of spiritual enlightenment. And thus, in any circumstances, a devotee of the Lord is in perfect order to speak of the right way of life. That is really a great test for a devotee, right? To be in that condition. 
I was able to see uh, some films. Uh, Buri John Prabhu was showing some film. He had made some film because he was a very good friend of uh, Gunagrahi Maharaj. Now, Gunagrahi Maharaj, he left his body in Vrindavan about a year ago now, maybe, or less. And uh, they had very, they, they, they had, he has films of all the kirtan they were doing. They were having a, Gunagrahi loved kirtan, and they would have kirtan constantly and constantly. And the day he left his body, they were also having kirtan. All the devotees were having, Govinda Maharaj was there, of course, because he was also a very close friend of Gunagrahi Maharaj. And it was very powerful to see how the devotees were behaving and how the, the kirtan that was going on and Gunagrahi Maharaj is leaving, departing from the world. He'd been, in, he's been suffering for cancer for some time and it was very painful, but the kirtan was really powerful. It was an amazing thing to see this uh, departure how the devotee leaves. So here's Grandfather Bhishma and he's also departing, but before he departs, he's speaking. Uh, Prabhupada writes, the father likes to see the son become more famous than himself. The Lord declares very emphatically that worship of his devotee is more valuable than the worship of the Lord Himself. Lord Krishna likes to see His devotee glorified. Lord Krishna was there. But Lord Krishna wanted Grandfather Bhishma to get the credit. This is the Lord's reciprocation with His devotee. He likes to see His devotee glorified. Krishna could have won the battle of Kurukshetra, but He gave the credit to Arjuna. He let Arjuna get the credit. And similarly here, Krishna could have pacified Maharaj Yudhisthira, but he wants Bhishma Dev to do it. And Bhishma Dev is getting the glory he's speaking. All right. So maybe you could just spend a few minutes to do this exercise. Taking into consideration Bhishma Dev's instructions to Maharaj Yudhisthira, make a list. If you want, you can draw a picture. Show aspects of how your community would be organized. Two groups. You are a member of a small community existing after a world war in which most of the world's population was wiped out. Right? <laughs> group A, based on, tw group on, based on verse 26, and group B based on verse 27. Do you think you could spend 10 minutes? So, can we make two groups? Yeah. Shall I make the, shall I bring down a, uh, the group marriage? Yeah, we need two groups, group A and group B. Yeah, okay. Shall I create? Yes, please.
Krishna Prabhu? Can you please join the group? So who's going to draw a picture? <laughs> no picture, only discussion. Okay, okay. So, do you have some clear idea what you're going to do? How many people do we have in the group? Maharaji, uh, we have eight devotees. Okay. And we have to uh, find out uh, from, the, from this uh, text that uh, how communities should be developed after uh, World War on the basis of Okay. Did you want to establish some kind of king, some kind of ruler? Taxation system? <laughs> 
Yes, ma'am. Uh, Srila Prabhupada uh, says that uh, as per Mahamanu, Sainta and Prasa, uh, Taram Sastra. So uh, it should be uh, one foot part king can take, but he said he should utilize it for uh, the public, for the subjects, not uh, uh, for exploitation. And king should work under the guidance of Brahmans and they should uh, take care of everyone so that everyone is engaged, fully engaged and uh, move towards the spiritual life. Okay. Okay, so I'll leave you with it. Draw up something. are separate and uh, you know they get trained as the boys get trained as brahmacharis the ladies get trained to uh, move ahead with the um, qualities that are important for proper marriage stable marriage you're, you're assuming that the, the this community is is all uh, made of made up of devotees uh, well, although i'm not sure that because Immediately to um, to uh, apply um, 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 the Vaishnav Vaishnav um, I mean the way of life. I'm not sure if that uh, maybe be accepted by everyone because this community is, is not necessarily all made up of devotees. Oh, we can make them devotees. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> they're not. You know. I mean, that would be. I mean. You know, if most of the world's population is wiped out, you can imagine that many people are going to be seeking some meaning in their lives and some shelter so that they don't get wiped out too. So it's kind of an ideal situation to um, induce people to take up the process of bhakti. They can actually, in spite of all the distresses in the material world, they can feel deep happiness within. Everyone's seeking that. So, I'm a, you know, yeah, a they, small community, like, well, let's say Mayapur, you know, that's what we would do here, that's what I'm thinking. They may not be devotees, the they may not be devotees, but they have to follow Shastra. But you know, we're in the technological era, everyone is communicating through, through text these days. Well, let's see how long it lasts. Yeah. I would like to suggest one thing is that in the second paragraph of the purport, uh, there, there are nine qualifications enumerated for all human beings. So I would suggest that that just to start with, the community can have can have these as like uh, just like maybe just like the ten commandments. We can have them as the nine commandments: not to become angry, not to lie. Maybe just as a, not commandments, you know, but uh, maybe just the basic, the fundamentals of, of our community. Principles to live by. Principles to live by. Yeah. Sorry about my camera, it's not working. Just like Sir Tolkien, he put the, the, some rules and regulations. Uh, in, the, in the second avenue temple, after he initiated some disciples, he put on the door a, a list of, of principles to follow. We can also do that in our community. Yeah. Okay, I think we have to... Hopefully there will be some Vaishnavas in the community. <laughs> and then um, we, we can uh, move in that direction. Everybody comes on board. So, like, uh, like the, the, we were mentioning earlier that four, the four types of people come to Krishna. So, the Arti, the one who is in distress, there is a high chance to come to Krishna. Yeah. So, for that. And uh, there is one more point in that uh, Vaishya category that uh, our.
Yes, Prabhu? Hare Krishna Prabhu? Hare Krishna Maharaj? Yeah, we want to close the rooms. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, it will get closed uh, after uh, 20 seconds. Oh, well, thank you. Hare Krishna. Everybody, Hare Krishna. Everybody came. Everybody's back. All right. So, so can can we have some feedback? A spokesman for Group A, speaking on verse number twenty-six. Verse number twenty-six. We'll just read the read the text. Yeah. 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 Um, twenty-six. The text. I can read that. Okay, please. At Maharaj Yudhisthira's inquiry, Bhishma Dev first defined all the classifications of castes and orders of life in terms of the individual quali individual's qualifications. Then he systematically, in twofold divisions, described counteraction by detachment and interaction by attachment. Um, so, uh, we didn't have so much time, and it's a long purport, so we started discussing, you know, just the establishment of Daivi Van Ashram. We're a small community. Most of the world has been, world population has been um, taken away by world war. And so everyone's in a very distressed circumstance. And we have some Vaishnavas in that community, maybe not all. And so we're going to try to establish um, someone as a Kshatriya to get the ball rolling <clears throat> and then um, he'll have a team of other of others that are like-minded and they'll consult with a Brahminical class that will also um, start a, start schools for the children and um, will also be giving regular lectures for the community and uh, then the Vaishas will um, live a very simple life, you know, not for economic development, but simple living. And a uh, barter system will be in place to we'll try to avoid competition, which led to the World War. And then the, um, the Bhishma Day has advised all human beings, um, advised for all human beings nine qualifications, not to become angry, not to lie. And we felt that this would be um, principles whereby the community would function following these these this, these nine points from Bhishma Dev. Um, well, there was some discussion that took place in the last um, 50 seconds on detachment and attachment, but it wasn't really clear to me what we came up with, so maybe we open that up for others in the group to bring up. I think that was basically it, and the, 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 you know, the, oh yeah, and then the ashrams, we, the the boys go into Gurukul, have brahmacharya training. The girls are trained uh, to develop the skills to be um, proper wives and mothers, and um, then the, we we, we um, the grahastas, you know, that's all arranged. Um, we try to arrange proper marriages with that. And, um, you know, based upon uh, the qualifications, you know, matching people up nicely. And uh, one of the principles, of course, is to, um, let's see, no, I guess that was, so to beget children only by one's legitimate wife. Because we're, the whole idea was to move more and more into Daivivan Ashram, where it's actually a, a Vaishnava community. And um, then... We didn't really get around to discuss. There was some discussion in the last 50 seconds or so on uh, sannyasa and brahmacharya, but um, 
we, I don't think we got so far with all that. Anyway, that's pretty much what I've got to present. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Any comments from anyone? Krishna uh, Maharaj, there are four varnas for ashram. Brahman, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Shudra. Brahman is to teach uh, on the basis of the Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam how to control the senses. Kshatriya has to give protection of the community. Vaishya has to do for animal protection. Shudras should not be allowed to have a banking. They should not have the money with them because they will misuse. And then we have to use two principles, attachment and detachment. Attachment is for the household, householder, those who are grasta, grasta ashram. Detachment is for one person and sannyasi. Brahmacharis, they can teach both the groups. They are being trained in such a way. Hare Krishna. Okay. That's group A. You 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 were with Jan Mastami? Prabhu? Yes, Maharaj. Yes. Yes. All right. Can we go to the next group? Group B? Dealing with text 27? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Actually, I was uh, asked by the devotees to uh, give the uh, summarized uh, discussion. So, uh, first point that came was that kings should have uh, systematic knowledge for the welfare of all. And this is only possible when, they, when the king works under the direction of Brahmin as per Shastric knowledge. And then only there could be a proper application of Varnashram Dharma. Then uh, ruler uh, should select cabinet not on uh, voting basis, like uh, from the perspective of uh, democracy or the exercise of democracy, but the ruler should select cabinet uh, as per the qualification. Only those uh, people who are qualified, they should be given responsibility. Then qualification is, is, is given, uh, if, if the people are qualified, then they should only be given the position and responsibility. And also it should be ensured that Brahmins are treated well. Then uh, it was also uh, discussed that uh, we, the people should, uh, the king should ensure and his, uh, his ministers uh, should ensure that the Lord is served well, Lord is happy. Then uh, if we do not do that, then what is going to happen is that uh, the people will be put into the material conditions of life. And there can be no liberation where we are trying to uh, get ourselves free from birth, old age, death and disease. So king or the uh, father or the spiritual master has to see that the, his subjects are basically uh, getting liberation from birth, old age, death and disease. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much Prabhu. Very interesting. All right. So, very interesting to hear all this. Oh. Can everyone see this picture, this slide? No, Maharaj. Huh? No. Put your name on it. There's no slide. There's no slide. Okay. Wait. Let's see. I have to come out. Can you see it now? Yeah. Okay, good. Can you see it? Yeah. 
Okay, good. Okay, we're here. Oh, we did this. Let's see. Okay, so we, we covered this. We were at the objectives. Overview of chapter 9. So we heard about the contents of chapter 9, that uh, Maharaj Yudhisthira comes to the place where Bhishma is laying on the bed of arrows and he's de very dejected and he's with Lord Krishna and Srila Vyasadeva and great sages and Grandfather Bhishma receives them and welcomes them and then at Maharaj Yudhisthira's request Bhishma Dev gives instruction about Varnashram, about ruling the kingdom. So, we also spoke about application of Queen Kunti's prayers, about cutting off family affection, when it's appropriate and inappropriate. If the family are devotees, generally it's considered inappropriate. But you have to consider also the age, that at a certain point in the life it's appropriate, even though the family may be devotees, because the tie of affection can be so strong, we may prefer, it, it may be not appropriate to remain in family life. The Pandavas as ideal executors of work and discuss the, its relevance in our life. Well, we, we didn't really discuss its relevance in our life. The Pandavas, ideal executors of work, perfect character and hardworking, not parasites. <laughs> so, very good example for us, all of us. We want to follow in the footsteps of these great devotees, certainly relevant for us. Yudhisthira's dejection listed reasons why he could not be convinced by the Lord. That Lord Krishna wanted to show the glory of Grandfather Bhishma. He wanted everyone to know how he excels everyone in knowledge. He wanted everyone to uh, understand that what had happened was due to the influence of time, it wasn't the, just the karma. Lord Krishna wants to glorify his devotee, Grandfather Bhishma. He wanted to show how he's unaffected by his condition, the pain, the condition which he's in doesn't trouble him. He's transcendental to the pain of the material body. And we've just recently, in the last few minutes, we spoke about something of Bhishma's instructions on Varnashram Dharma and how they're relevant for ISKCON, our members, the teachings of Varnashram. We don't know when the world is going to fall apart, but it's coming very close to it in the recent year with the current situation. You don't know how long this kind of thing can go on. It may go on more, it may in increase. More and more people may die. We may come to this kind of conclusion, to come to this kind of situation where we have to re-establish the government and we hope at that time there can be a good government and they can utilize some of Bhishma Dev's instructions for Varnashram. Everyone has a duty, everyone has work, everyone is taken care of, and everyone's a part of the society. Right? Okay. That we covered. A final quote. In all the above mentioned dealings of the Lord, He is the hero in all circumstances, and hearing about Him, or about His devotees, or combatants, 
is conducive to spiritual life. It is said that the Vedas and Puranas, etc., are all made to revive our last relation with Him. Hearing all these scriptures is essential. From the Purport, chapter 8, text number 38. This one? Thank you. This one. Thank you, Maharaj. Okay. Any final question? Any comments? Anything? So we'll, if not, we'll meet tomorrow. We'll continue to hear more about Grandfather Bhishma and his glorious departure. Okay, thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Thunderbirds. All glories to assembled devotees.